You know, too many people are missing out on one of the most influential Christian leaders of the 20th century. His life and ministry has influenced millions around the world, particularly within the Pentecostal and charismatic community. In this episode of Theology Breakdown, I want to provide some of my thoughts on William J. Seymour, one of the pioneers of the Pentecostal movement, an African-American leader who's uh, really been an inspiration to me, even affected uh, some of my own writings, my first book uh, on Pentecostal worship. You know, my name is Josh Samuel, and I'm the host of Theology Breakdown, where I try to break down the transforming themes of theology in an accessible format. Seymour was the leader and pastor at the Azusa Street Mission. You may have heard about the Azusa Street Revival. Well, that is uh, one of the most influential revivals that's really influenced uh, millions around the world. A lot of people look to it uh, just as a, as a model, as kind of an icon uh, of early Pentecostalism. The Azusa Street Revival experienced its most intense revival during its the years of 1906 to 1909, where thousands uh, flocked to the Azusa Street Revival and, and many even more uh, were reading and hearing about the Azusa Street Revival and saw how it could uh, really be a blessing to their own lives personally uh, and within their own church context. A key distinguishing teaching uh, of the Azusa Street Revival uh, that they really highlighted related to Jesus' promise in Acts 1.8 and its fulfillment in Acts 2. Uh, let me read to you uh, Acts 1, 8 and how it kind of uh, relates to Acts 2 and why the, the people at the Azusa Street Revival really saw this as, as crucial for something they wanted to experience. You see, in Acts 1, 8, Jesus says this, uh, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And what was the fulfillment? Well, the Azusa Street Revival adherents looked to Acts 2 verses 1 to 4 as that fulfillment. Let me read to you uh, what Luke says in Acts 2, 1 to 4. Uh, he writes, When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. There was a core group of around 15 African Americans who joined with William J. Seymour at Richard and Ruth Asbury's home in 1906. And in 1906, uh, Friday, April 6, 1906 actually, uh, members of this group decided to take things a little bit further. They wanted to experience spirit baptism as uh, they read in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 2. And they decided to take it a step further by actually having a 10-day fast. And each day they would study Acts 2 and really pray into the evening that they too would experience spirit baptism as the disciples experienced in Acts 2. You know, they eventually experienced spirit baptism uh, with tongues as they read in the book of Acts. And uh, interestingly enough, quite a lot of people began to flock to this uh, group of around 15 and many started to come and they too wanted to experience renewal and revival. In fact, they said that so many people came to the Asbury's home that at one point, uh, there were so many people there, the front porch of that home actually collapsed. Uh, thankfully, no one was severely injured, uh, but that experience kind of made them realize like, okay, well, like we, we need to find a new place. We need to find uh, uh, another building to really kind of house uh, what's really happening here because there's a, a lot of people really wanting to seek this experience of the Spirit. Uh, and that's what led to them going to uh, what eventually called the Azusa Street Mission, which was a, a humble building in Los Angeles. So they found this new building and uh, lots of people were coming still and there was great renewal, great revival. And let me read to you the way they explained what was happening. I'm going to read to you a little, a direct quote from their first newsletter from the Apostolic Faith in 1906. Let me, let me read to you what they were sharing, what was happening among them. 
The power of God now has the city agitated as never before. Pentecost has surely come and with it the Bible evidences are following, many being converted and sanctified and filled with the Holy Spirit, speaking in tongues as they did on the day of Pentecost. Now some of those people who received uh, these tongues thought they were actually receiving a new language and so they thought, hey, they, they got this language and it was a language that they could communicate the gospel and, and go to different lands to uh, share the gospel through this new language. Uh, eventually within the Pentecostal movement, uh, people saw this as uh, may maybe just uh, unknown languages, maybe a heavenly language, not necessarily uh, a human language. This was a, a fascinating time where people were experiencing a work of the Spirit uh, and uh, William J. Seymour was a really crucial leader during this Azusa Street Revival. Well, you know, he's the pastor. You know, there was uh, an eyewitness to this uh, movement, Frank Bartleman, who was actually a, a white man, who, who shared uh, this line that's pretty famous about what they experienced. You know, he said, uh, the color line was washed away in the blood. What he was trying to say was that whites and blacks and Latinos and Asians were now all coming together, uh, worshiping God and experiencing a work of the Spirit. This is huge. Remember, this is the early 1900s. Uh, this is not, you know, in the 2000s. This is not, you know, 2021 what, when I'm recording this video. This is a time where in the U.S. they had these Jim Crow laws. Let me read to you what the Jim Crow laws were really all about. The Jim Crow laws required the separation of white people and people of color on all forms of public transportation in schools, parks, theaters, and restaurants. Often anyone who was suspected of having a black ancestor, even just one in the very distant past, was considered to be a person of color and therefore subject to the Jim Crow laws. The overarching purpose of Jim Crow laws was to prevent contact between black people and white people as equals, uh, a racist approach seeking to establish white people as above black people. In this moment of Jim Crow laws, uh, the Azusa Street Revival happened. An African-American man is leading it and various ethnic groups are coming together. I mean, this is incredible. I mean, this is uh, 50 years before Martin Luther King Jr.'s incredible I Have a Dream speech uh, was stated. I mean, this is a moment where uh, segregation is literally part of law and we have an African-American man leading with various people groups coming together and experiencing a work of the Spirit. Thousands are coming and affecting thousands and thousands upon more and even millions today through the Pentecostal and charismatic community. If you think about it, it wasn't until 1865 that slavery was abolished in the United States of America. And to be honest, William J. Seymour's parents were actually slaves at one point in their lives and were only freed four years before he was born. He lived in a very unique moment, a difficult moment, but led in that moment. Now, I'm not trying to say that William J. Seymour is the only pioneer of the Pentecostal Lumen. I mean, we could talk about Charles Parham in the States, we can talk about Pandita Ramabai in India, and several others. But I would like to argue here that William J. Seymour's ministry at the Zuza Street Revival was that place which really popularized that Pentecostal spirituality that just wasn't accomplished in other centers that were experiencing these types of revivals. Uh, people really looked to this revival and was learning and gleaning and really being influenced in ways unlike any other revivals like it. The Azusa Street Revival really became uh, an iconic moment uh, for Pentecostals. Even in my book on Pentecostal worship, I actually looked to William J. Seymour's life and ministry uh, at the Azusa Street Revival as a potential source for renewal for today because I, I think it's, a, it's an incredible inspiration for us today. Let me tell you at least three things that are especially inspiring about William J. Seymour's life. Number one, he was passionate about God and his word. Here's the thing, you know, around 1905, he actually went to go study uh, with a guy by the name of Charles Parham. And uh, Charles Parham had a Bible school in Texas. And so he was teaching people and William J. Seymour went there and because of the Jim Crow laws and, you know, the, the, the very racist laws, uh, 
Parham was actually teaching white students in the classroom, but William J. Seymour uh, had to go outside in the hallway, so the door had to be open, and he was learning from the outside. Um, in the midst of that difficult moment and experience of learning, William J. Seymour was there willing to do whatever it cost to learn, to grow. Here's another interesting fact about William J. Seymour that many people may not realize. Uh, you know, a lot of times people talk about Pentecostals and Charismatics and they say, well, you know, you guys are all about an experience. But the interesting thing about William J. Seymour is that he studied uh, spirit baptism and saw its associations with the, the experience of tongues. And he actually was learning and even teaching that concept of spirit baptism and how tongues accompany uh, spirit baptism, but he had actually never personally experienced it until April 12th uh, during that 10-day fast, that moment uh, with the Asperis. And so I think that's really interesting that he was willing to teach on something even before he was uh, experiencing it uh, because, you know, he was just someone who was really wanted to, to grow and understand his word. And even if he didn't really experience it just yet, he was willing to affirm it. The second really inspiring thing I love about William J. Seymour was that he was a humble man of prayer. Uh, you know, he was known as someone who was humble, uh, who was uh, a respectful person, gentle, and uh, a guy by the name of Frank Bartleman, uh, who I mentioned earlier, uh, had this to say about uh, uh, Seymour. Let, let me read to you what he says. Brother Seymour generally sat behind two empty shoe boxes, one on top of the other, which served as the mission's pulpit. He usually kept his head inside the top one during the meeting in prayer. There was no pride there. Here's someone who is in the middle of an incredibly powerful revival, getting lots of attention. And he's, uh, you know, really humbling himself, you know, you know, bowing his head down and, and really not trying to make a big deal of himself in the midst of the revival. You know, sometimes uh, sometimes people get a lot of attention and, you know, they might put their their their, their head on a, on a, bull, a billboard. But Seymour's putting his head uh, inside one of those uh, those boxes for prayer. A great scholar by the name of Cecil Robick uh, has this to say about uh, Seymour's approach to prayer. Let me read to you what he says. Before arriving in Los Angeles, Seymour had committed himself to the personal discipline of spending five or more hours each day in prayer. In those first weeks following his arrival in Los Angeles, Seymour had increased this prayer time. Maybe it really shouldn't come to us as no surprise that God would use a man like William J. Seymour, who was willing to take that posture of prayer, uh, committing himself to five or more hours to prayer, really being open to what God has for his life. The third inspiring thing I love about William J. Seymour is his grand vision for the people of God. If you look at Seymour's life and ministry, you got to admit that in many ways, he really was ahead of his time and in many ways, even ahead of our time, if we're honest. First off, let me tell you, you know, a lot of times we talk about spirit baptism and how he saw its association with tongues. Uh, of course, that was an important part of what he was teaching, but it's important for us to also note that he maintained the chief evidence, the ultimate evidence of being spirit baptized was love. That this is something that's a fruit of the spirit and love should be more manifest in your life and it should affect the way you treat other people. Isn't that interesting? that the man who led the Azusa Street Revival uh, saw love as a chief evidence of this work of the Spirit. And of course, he's the person that is leading a place where you have uh, blacks, whites, Latinos, Asians, and more coming together side by side, worshiping God equally before God because they are equal before God. But here's someone who is really trying to make sure people follow this uh, important truth of God's Word. Another thing I really loved about his grand vision for the people of God is that he was willing to see all types of people of all different backgrounds empowered for ministry. Hey, if the Spirit of God was moving in your life, you should be able to minister. You should, we should be open to you ministering. So he didn't really have any barriers when it came to age or gender or socioeconomic status 
or if you were an ordained minister, uh, if the Spirit of God was moving in your life, uh, you might be someone who, who might share, who might testify, who might lead in songs, uh, who might preach the Word. And he was someone who was willing to see all types of people sent out for ministry. The people who came to the Azusa Street Revival wasn't just multicultural, but even the people who are sent out from the Azusa Street Revival was also multicultural. He was willing to empower all types of people uh, that didn't just look like him. Seymour is a fascinating character that I think uh, he is in many ways neglected, but super influential and we need to hear more about him. If you're interested, there's a lot of great resources out there. I put some links in the description below. Hey, Cecil M. Robick Jr.'s uh, book, The Azusa Street Mission and Revival, is a fascinating yet accessible book that'll not only introduce you to the Azusa Street Revival, but of course, William J. Seymour's Life and Ministry. Another great book uh, that I just recently got that I really love it is Gaston Espinoza's book, William J. Seymour and the Origins of Global Pentecostalism, a biography and documentary history. Uh, it provides a biography, but it also includes uh, a lot of uh, uh, Seymour's writings. And I don't know any other resource that includes that type of information. So definitely get that book if you can get it. And hey, of course, you know, I wrote a book on Pentecostal worship uh, called The Holy Spirit and Worship Music, Preaching in the Altar, Renewing Pentecostal Corporate Worship. And for me, uh, Seymour and the Azusa Street Revival was a place that I probed to see how it might provide renewal for our contemporary corporate worship context today as well. So that, that might be a book that might be helpful for you as well. Thanks for listening to the end today. Uh, I'd love to hear from you. And uh, if you happen to just get on my YouTube channel, why don't you just uh, write a comment below and just tell me what what thing about Seymour did you especially appreciate? Maybe something that maybe I didn't even mention uh, that you may be aware of that you, you, you really love about him. Why don't you leave a comment below? I'd love to hear from you. If theological topics uh, interest you, be sure to follow Theology Breakdown on your favorite social media platform. Thanks for listening today. Much love and God bless.